There's a lot of text on some of my slides, and I'm not going to read it all here, so I've made them available at the website shown, which is bit.ly slash Shubin MIC. That's Shubin as in my last name, and MIC as in Medical Imaging Consortium. This is the earliest known published report of an actual video image. It appeared in 1879. The author and inventor, incidentally, was an ophthalmic and oral surgeon named Dennis Daniel Redmond, who uh, both practiced surgery and did his inventing in Dublin, Ireland. Here's an enlargement of part of the report. Redmond compared the pixels of his system to the rods and cones in the retina, and as far as there being individual photosites, that's an accurate comparison but we have many, many more rods and cones than photosites in his system. We don't know what the original resolution was for his system, but the system he got to work had a connection from each camera pixel to a corresponding display pixel. So if he had only a 10 by 10 array of pixels, that would be 100 individual connections. For a 100 by 100 array, it would be 10,000 individual connections. Uh, the image I've shown here is from another inventor, George Carey, and uh, he too tried a pixel-to-pixel -pixel connection. Now, Redmond recognized that those pixel-to-pixel -pixel connections were impractical, so he intended to use the image scanning of what was then called the copying telegraph. This diagram is for the first patent for a copying telegraph. It was issued to Alexander Bain in Britain in 1843. It's essentially a fax machine, but without any optical sensor. It introduced the concepts of scanning lines, pixels, and both line and frame synchronization. For the 25th anniversary of the Institute of Image Electronics Engineers of Japan in 1997, Masayuki Miyazawa, then of Nagano Institute of Technology, built a pair of Bain fax machines according to the 1843 patent, and they worked quite well. You can see them operating here, and you can see the synchronized scanning of the transmitter and the receiver, and the individual scanning lines. It's going to zoom in, and you'll be able to see um, the image of the character that's being scanned. Here's an image transmitted by the 1843 copying telegraph in 1997. Here's an early copying telegraph transmission in 1850 from a different inventor, Frederick Bakewell. As you can see, the received image was blue. We can count about 36 scanning lines in the message that was transmitted. This is from an even more refined version developed by Giovanni Caselli, which went into commercial service in France in 1865. We can count 15 scanning lines in just the flower bud on the left side. The greater the resolution, however, the longer it took to transmit the image. Redmond was unable to make the scanned version of his video system work because the selenium photocell he was using took too long to recover its resistance after light exposure. Here's a chart of the resistance of a selenium photocell both during and after exposure to light. And please note that the units of the x-axis, time, are labeled in minutes, clearly, that was much too slow for scanned television. Nevertheless, the first television patent was issued in Germany in 1885 to Paul Nipkov. Redmond chose not to patent his system. He thought it was of importance to the public. The scanning mechanism that Nipkov chose was a spinning disk with a spiral of perforations. And as you can see from the patent diagram here, he chose 24 perforations, which would be 24 scanning lines of resolution. 
Despite many advances, the first video image of a recognizable human face was not achieved until 40 years later in 1925 in London. The inventor, John Logie Baird, chose 30 scanning lines at 12.5 frames per second. And this is a very early image that you're seeing here. He very quickly got to much better images without changing the resolution. The amount of resolution that inventors chose was often based on the application. So here's a 1927 paper from the Bell System, the telephone company in the United States, describing a video telephone service. And it called for 50 scanning lines of resolution on the basis of the resolution of half-tone newspaper photographs of faces, which typically used a 50-line screen. What might today be called the standard definition of mechanically scanned television lasted roughly 10 years, from about 1926 to about 1935. Different forms of rotating components were used. In Japan, Kenjiro Ta Takayanagi used a mechanically scanned camera, but an electronic picture tube display. Even back in the 1920s, there was a push for more spatial resolution. This comparison of 30-line and 96-line images was offered at the 1928 Berlin radio show, The Ancestor of Today's Internationale Funkausstellung. Perhaps the people who were pushing 96-line pictures, however, made the 30-line look worse than it really had to based on this off-screen photograph of an actual 30-line broadcast in London. By 1935, a British parliamentary committee recommended a move to what they then called high-definition television. They defined it as having a resolution not less than 240 lines. By the 1940s, there were experiments with what we would even today consider high-definition television. France began broadcasting 819-line television in 1948. It had 737 active or picture-carrying lines. And there were even experiments with 1,000-line color television. Today, thanks to work pioneered here in Japan, We've gone from standard definition to high definition television, and there are further steps to 4K and 8K television, super high vision, as you've been hearing about today. Those numbers are based on the number of pixels per scanning line, not the number of scanning lines in the image. This is typical of what happens when a viewer is presented with an 8K image. He or she is drawn to view it up close. Clearly, this is not how television is typically viewed in a home. For medical imaging, however, there's nothing wrong with getting close to a screen. This display, called the world's smallest 8K monitor, has a 55-inch diagonal and would fit nicely in a medical office. It was shown by Astro Design, one of the sponsors of today's symposium, at the National Association of Broadcasters Convention in Las Vegas in April. And as Dr. Fujita mentioned earlier, Panasonic also has a 55-inch 8K display. Over the years, video image sensing technology has moved from mechanical scanning to camera tubes to solid-state image sensors. As the spatial resolution increases, however, if the image sensor size stays the same, the photo sites get smaller. That raises concerns about sensitivity and noise. For bigger sensors, there are also depth of field concerns. Smaller photosites also raise issues of diffraction, and whether they're large or small, um, there's an issue of yield. A single bad photosite can put a visible dot in the picture. Might we solve some of the problems by returning to mechanical scanning? This diagram shows some recent work done at Carnegie Mellon and Columbia Universities in the United States. A single line image sensor is used. This is not an array, it's just a single line. And the image is scanned by the rapidly tilting mirrors in a digital micro mirror device 
the same technology used in DLP projectors, digital light processing projectors, which are commonly used for digital cinema. Digital technology allows other forms of image processing to help with the optical constraints of 8K imaging. When lenses didn't seem good enough for 8K television, NHK worked with Astro Design on digital chromatic aberration correction. You've probably seen some recent reports of something called the world's largest photograph, which was created by combining 70,000 individual images. So uh, what you see here is a picture of the mountain Mont Blanc on the um, French and Swiss border. Um, but you could zoom in to one of those 70,000 individual images and actually see a climber and see the clothes that the climber is wearing. Stitching is possible for motion imaging too. It doesn't have to be just still images. Now the image of Mont Blanc was static, but when images move, dynamic resolution is important. And it can be increased either by going to a higher frame rate or simply by reducing the exposure time per frame with the same frame rate. Comfortable television viewing requires smooth motion portrayal. Television frame rates were established initially to reduce flicker perception. But today, flicker is no longer tied to frame rate. So it's that smooth motion representation that's what's important. If acceptable motion smoothness can be described in terms of pixels per second, then if you increase the spatial resolution, providing more pixels, then you need to have increased frame rate to have the same number of pixels per second. For medical imaging, smooth motion might not be required, so reduced exposure per frame might be used to increase the dynamic resolution. It's important, however, to have sufficient temporal resolution to show desired events. So here I'm showing a short exposure time and a desired event that's happening while the shutter is closed and so you don't get to see it. A team led at the University of Tokyo has the current record for frame rate, 4.4 trillion frames per second at 450 by 450 pixels, which is not even high definition television, let alone super high vision, that's 891 quadrillion pixels per second, an extraordinary number of pixels per second. At such rates, with the playback slowed down, it's possible to watch a pulse of light move across the screen. At such high rates, it's also possible to fire a pulse of light, a femtosecond pulse of light, let it bounce off surfaces and return to the camera, sort of like radar, and then calculate what it bounced off, enabling a camera to see around corners. That's something that might be useful in medical imaging. You can see this being done with an older MIT camera operating at just one trillion frames per second at the link shown. Return one last time to Redmond's 1879 report. Again, he compared his photoreceptors to the rods and cones in a retina. But retinas do not have frame rates. What if we could do television without frame rates? Here you can see a disk with a dot on it. As the disk spins, the dot disappears. Any non-smooth motion, by the way, was caused by my recording. It was not a function of um, this video, and I urge you to go to the website to see the original video. What's demonstrated here is an image sensor that functions as a retina does. Instead of shooting frames, its pixels respond to change. In this slowed video, the dot is clearly visible. Yes, the images are crude today, but this offers a glimpse into one possible future of sensors without frame rates. Thank you very much for your attention.